slash Earth Debate and Pet and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere. And there's also a PayPal, Patreon, crypto thanks button in the info box below the video. Speaking of Patreon, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Flat Earth Sage, Goldie McKinnon, Phoenix Rising 86, Retro Bill, More Books, Canna Bear, Fiber Oats, Michael Kahn, Rob H, John Kays, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Troy Shuker, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo The One, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, The Real Gabster, Liam Nendrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Texas Mike, and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I will hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. Let me just line it up here. Should I turn the intro music down a little bit, do you think? you got to play it for me to comment. I mean, when you watch the show back, the intro music to me seems quite a bit too loud. It's only quiet or quieter. Yes, it's very loud. The intro music. Yes, it like, because like, I'm sitting in my car. When you go from the pre-show to the live show, it like jolts me out of my seat. I think I think the um, the music's too loud for it. I'll turn it down. But the music is great. I love it. Don't ever change that. Just like don't ever stop housekeeping. I said the other day, a while ago, people were talking about they don't like the housekeeping questions. They wish you would get rid of them. I was like, are you kidding me? That's like everything. It won't give me the, the volume. Jewels. Won't give me the volume control unless I transition. Um. The intro is playing and we're all talking to each other. You just can't hear the intro. So for anyone listening to this, it's, it's horrendous. But there we go. Minus 5.4, that's good. Let's do the other one. Sorry about that, audience. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm done now. See, now, I was I was levelling it up by comparison to the YouTube music, which has probably spent, had thousands spent on it. And they've, you know, they've got it gain set just matched perfectly to as loud as it can humanly be in YouTube with as much compression as applied as possible to take, you know, the... The sort of perceived level up really high as well, not just the peak level. Um, net result, you end up with this really blasting intro when it does the countdown for two or three or four minutes, depending on which length I pick. So the old YouTube pr premiering intro. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. That one. Well, that, that plays considerably louder than my intro. But I shouldn't really focus on that. I should focus on how balanced the show as a whole is. Because that only, you know, the intro music only goes out with it when it's premiering. And after that, it stands alone, right? And you might you might have just listened to an advert. But generally speaking, the adverts are a, a little bit better balanced with most people's average sort of volume level in YouTube. 
um, but the intro music is just loud. And I think I think I know why. It's like it serves as an alarm. So if you're sat waiting for a show to start, and you've got like I don't know your iPad sat up and set up in your kitchen, and you wander off into the lounge, forget about waiting for the show, and then it starts. You can hear it from a mile away on the other side of the house. Dun, 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 dun. You're like, bloody hell. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah, my show started. But yeah, now it's not leveled up with that. So when the show actually starts and you're listening to it with one of those countdown intros, the show will be quieter than the intro. But that's just, I, I think it should be balanced with the show itself and not with the intro countdown timer, I should say. S slides are up if you want to go, Nathan. Starting with the highlighted astronomy one. Correct. Got the green light? Yep. All right. So elements of astronomy, um, celestial navigation comes from that. Chapter one, on the doctrine of the sphere, the imaginary concave surface in which a spectator at first conceives all the heavenly bodies placed is a hemisphere in the center of the base of which he himself is situated. The base of this hemisphere is the plane by which his view of the heavens is bounded. It is called the plane of the horizon. The numerous bodies observed on the concave surface differ in luster and apparently in magnitude, let me close my window, sorry about that. All of them appear in, to have a daily motion. Many of them emerge as if it were from below the plane of the horizon. And after traversing the concave surface, disappear to rise again at the same points of the horizon as before. Others in their paths never reach the horizon, but continually move around a fixed point of the heavens. Far the greater number of celestial bodies preserve the same situation with respect to each other. That is, they preserve the same apparent distances from each other. These are called fixed stars. Before we move on, did anyone spot the begging of the question as they went through this? What do they assume already is happening when the stars disappear? Concave Earth. <laughs> right. So they're already begging the question, we live on a sphere, and the reason we don't see them is they went below us, and all we have is an eye line to the horizon. So we can't see anything below, because that'd be our nadir. We only see everything above the horizon up to our 90 degree. Therefore, you get your 90. But let's read it again before I go on the next slide, because I want to, this time, add commentary. The imaginary concave surface in which a spectator at first conceives all the heavenly, heavenly bodies place. Well, that's the celestial sphere. It's imaginary. We have to imagine it that way. Is a hemisphere in the center of the base of which he himself is situated. So this celestial sphere that I have to imagine above me that gives me the protractor view of the heavens straight up is 90 my zenith to my left could be 180 to my right could be zero just like a protractor all right the base of the hemisphere is the plane by which his view of the heavens is bounded so now they're admitting that the base is a plane is a flat earth it's just like the protractor a baseline and i could see from zero to 180 and directly above me is 90. It is called the plane of the horizon. The numerous bodies observed on the concave surface, that's talking about celestial sphere that I have to imagine, differ in luster and apparently in magnitude. Obviously faint stars, strong, uh, you know, bright stars. All of them appear to have a daily motion. Yeah, they do. All of them have a daily motion. <laughs> not the earth turning. Many of them emerge as if it were below the plane. First begging question on this matter of a sphere we live on. So many of them emerge as if it were below the plane. So now they're saying there's something underneath me, the other part of what? Of this globe earth they want me to imagine. They haven't proven it, but they already got me in the begging of the question. 
No, but they, they haven't even the next slide. well, they haven't even attempted to suggest it, have they? Because they're putting you in the center of the celestial sphere model with them describing what you see as the inside of a bowl, you know, the concave surface of the sky. Well, that's the outside edge of a hemisphere of the dome of the heavens, if you want to call it that. Your perspective view. But when did they, in this paragraph, actually put you on the surface of that dome of the heavens to have the curved surface no, of no, the curved they earth? They, they never have. I'm sorry. No, they never have you on the on the curved part of anything. You're on the plane. You're on the baseline of the protractor. Right. But when the star, but when you don't see the stars, they're telling you it's because they're underneath you, just like Australia. Well, so what but they're see, saying in this instance is that you're standing on a flat plane, and the sky rotates around the flat plane. That's what they're actually correct. saying, isn't it? Correct. That's what I'm going to show with the next slides. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just want to check on following along. Yeah. All right. So now we go to dip correction. You say, well, well, what does this got to do? Well, it's that picture. It's that illustration. There is that, that curved dome of the heavens that's supposed to be the celestial sphere. And then there I am at A. And there is a protractor. Looks like a protractor. Like, <laughs> acts like a protractor. It must be a protractor because E is my zenith, my 90 over A. And if I'm on a boat 10 feet up at B, my Dip correction is height of I above DAC, the plane sea level. And that's the correction so I could get the baseline, so I get an elevation angle to that star that I'm imagining is in the celestial sphere. Let's move on. This next image shows only the top half of their presupposed globe and celestial sphere. But see, you remember, this might help that first question you Posed to me. You remember um, when I said the almanac and all its uh, numbers tables is emanating from the center of the earth? Well, in the verbiage, you are that center. So this tree is you, or it's, a, or it's a measurement from the tree, and that's supposed to be the center of the earth. This plane you see here, the circular disk, is the equatorial plane in reality to them. And yet it's the surface at the same time. So as you can see here, there's an imaginary celestial sphere. There's the luminaries doing their thing, in this case, the sun. And then when it shows it red, it's because it's going, as you can see, the rest of it under the other part of the sphere, the bottom half of that hemisphere that's cut in half. This is the center of Earth right here. This is not the surface of Earth where you get these angles from. This will make more sense. Let's keep going. So measuring an angle, read the measure of an angle of the ray that crosses the protractor scale. Well, we know it's an elevation angle for celestial navigation and also astronomy. And you got to have that as your baseline. The only, the only place to have this as a baseline is to cut the earth in half, just like we saw previously. So all measurements come from the center of the earth, which is a plane. So nothing comes from a curved surface. You have to imagine all of that. Next. So here we are. This is interchangeable in our conversation because this is either the actual surface of the Earth, which is the way we look at it, or this is the equatorial plane, the way they look at it. Either way, it's a disk, it's a circle, it's flat. And there's your altitude elevation angle and your azimuth, the direction or bearing. And the sun's GP has to be on that plane disk somewhere directly underneath where it's at. And that's why it's a right angle measurement. You can't get a right angle measurement from the surface of the Earth or a sphere. Next slide. So this kind of helps. Um, that equator line is that flat disk we were talking about. They put a protractor on it, and then they created a local version of it on top to say this is the local horizon or the local celestial view of the person, because it could be anywhere on the circle according to them, but it's the same thing. It's one and the same. The, when you cut their sphere in half, you have a disc, a plane to where all the angles in the books and the tables emanate from. Then they have you saying, you gotta do that on the surface for it to work, as you see here, because you can't get an elevation angle from a curved surface. Do you see what they're doing? 
Sit in, guys. Hey. hey, Adam. Adam. Good stuff. Yeah, I do see what they're doing. They're taking the yeah. angle from a flat plane, which is on your third diagram, which I'll put back up with the tree in the middle. That's where you're standing. You're standing on the centre of this flat plane to get these angles. But then they've transposed what is actually the arc of the heavens into the arc of the ground you're standing on. So now the tree, which would have been at the centre of this point where the angle's drawn out from, suddenly has a snow globe over the top of it, which also has a flat plane. It's like, this very much doesn't work with the sphere, does it? <laughs> Excellent summary. Excellent summary. They're in Gloucester today, Adam. I thought they were in Gloucester tomorrow. No, it's Thursday. Gloucester, Gloucester today, uh, Brum tomorrow. Okay. I may not go. <laughs> you what? I may not go. You may not. I'm going to go down anyway because I'm going to take this other banner and then I'll get Jason to post you the other one um, so that it can at least join up with the tour. Um, so if not, I might just ring you if you're doing the show because I, I'll, not be, I'll probably be getting there around about 2, two o'clock or something like that because it would just be a flying visit. One of the things um, that puts me off, presumably you're not that familiar with Birmingham then, because you're like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just rock on in. No, and... I, I did my qualification exam in Birmingham. Um, How many years ago? Uh, How many years ago? Yeah, shut up. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I meant. What I mean, what I mean yeah. by that is, since then, Birmingham has been completely reconstructed. There's a few landmarks that remain, but the, the essence of the city that you knew is gone. It's completely right. different now linked up in very different ways and looks very different. If you walk through Selfridges now, you can overlook what used to be the, um, is it the UCI? I forgot forgotten the name of the cinema. Odeon, um, along with New Street Station and all those massive buildings that you used to only see from street level with all the buses going by. Well, now there's like a walkway that you look over them. It's really bizarre. Oh, that was, quite quite that, breathtaking. It looks quite That was quite the impressive. last time I was there. It was with you at the conference in, when it was in Birmingham City Centre. Um, yeah, and that was a nightmare because it was just you were just driving around a building site, weren't you? I, I didn't, he couldn't tell any of the, I couldn't tell where I was. I just got to the hotel and stayed there. Yeah, so no, your way around, it's fair, it's fair, it's okay. You can park in Selfridges and just wait your way to the bull if that's where they are. But if you don't know your way around, you just get lost really quickly. That sounds like that might be tomorrow then. Um, yeah, but what I'll do is I'll go down and I'll. Because I can't stream myself, but if I join the G+, I can just stream. That would be ideal, because then, yeah, you're only using your bandwidth for the for the Skype call or whatever equivalent yeah. on the G+, but then you're effectively streaming, right? Yeah, so I can send it to you and just do a little link up and say hello from there. And I'll show you the banner with it, with it there, hand it over, and then uh, I'll head back, because I want to try and spend the day there on... Tuesday, because they're in Nottingham on Tuesday, so I want to spend most of the day. So I just fly down, drop the banner off. Quick fly down to Birmingham, as you do from Nottingham. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean, fly down in the car. Yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's just it's a good, good, good couple of hours, isn't it, if not three? Yeah. Can, nah, I, add that, that, can I add to that, Adam, and say it's a plane drive for you? It'd be a very plane drive, yeah. <laughs> it's all downhill on the way. I like picture two, just to change the subject, Tom, that you've put up there. You know what I was discussing yesterday? Um, that exemplifies what I was saying about it becoming an obtuse angle. If you look at that picture, E to A to C, where at point A, the eye is on the water. You then raise the eye to B, look. You can see how the angle has become obtuse and why the angle has become obtuse. Sorry, which yeah. diagram? Um, Correcting the, the after, altitude, 67. Second the one, one. The second okay. one, the one after the astronomy. I got it, I got it. Read. Now, if you see, if you raise B even more, then the angle becomes even more obtuse. Now, it's not just that straight geometry because we're working in perspective. So A to C works via perspective, doesn't it? So the alignment from A to C, the straight, uh, or B to C, is still subject to perspective. So it's not the geometric angle that you're taking there. It's the perspective adjustment for the height. That's how the 
height of eye correction. As I best understand how it's it's developed, is 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 in that way. No, you're you're absolutely right. In fact, let's we got a few minutes here. So C is the visible horizon that you're aiming your horizon mirror to. A is the navigator. He's on a small craft, so he's above the surface of the sea. So he's at B, and it's an obtuse angle. He needs to get it to a true 90 in order to minus the elevation angle to be left with the co-altitude of the zenith angle, which would be the distance at 69 miles per degree. So he's got to match the actual surface of the Earth and say, yeah, I'm nine feet above the waterline, but I need to be exact. I'm going to the waterline because that is a baseline that's straight and even, sea level. Now I can take this uh, correction and put a check mark on it because I'm getting closer to true 90. The only thing left is refraction. And that refraction, as you can see, they're talking about, has to do with pressure and temperature of water and air, not curvature. In fact, if you go, are you still here, Nathan? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you go to the image uh, just before the last one, with the angle measuring device to the sun, do you see that? Measuring an angle. Oh, sorry. Yes, I've got that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so see, the base of that has to be flat. That's dip correction. That's, he just made it equal to where the horizon is. Then the only thing left is to do the azimuth bearing. So if this thing was tilted from the center of it up, it, it'd be obtuse. So he has to go put it on the sea surface flat, just like it shows in order to get that 90, to subtract it from 90, that angle. All the way to the GP of the sun, Thousands of miles, that has to be straight baseline. Yeah, it's the line marked azimuth. Yep. Coming out from the protractor. Uh, from the, yeah, from the right angle triangle. Yeah. Remember they fought us on that? No, there's no right angle triangle. <laughs> These so anti flat just sure came out with a bang. Yeah, I remember the whole don't mention 90 thing. Embarrassing, really. It was so funny. I go, wait a minute, I'm reading your books and it's mentioning it all the time. Why can't I mention it? earth debate live i'm your host nathan oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a nathan oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the flat earth debate if you would like to support the channel there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live and there's also a paypal patreon crypto link and thanks button in the info box below the video most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you're currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. 
If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel, so please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. Now we are joined by Arwin, Neil, Tenth Man, Adam, Chocolate Sane, Refractor Curvature, and a whole bunch of people in Discord. So welcome, one and all. Hello. Hello, Hello everyone. Hey, good, good morning, morning, everyone. Good Hello. morning. Hello, oh, good to have you all. Should we do a bit of housekeeping for proper, for real? Like, we haven't done it for a few days. We've Absolutely. focused on one question at a time, which is also nice, but uh, also good to get through housekeeping as, as a fairly concise full list. I've taken everyone off mute in Discord if you want to join in with the fun. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as the curve of the Earth? Nope. Only considerations. We destroyed, the geom we destroyed the geometry, though. So those geometric considerations, yeah, they went in 2020, though, didn't they? What geometric considerations? There is no geometry. We debunked it. But they could Earth still geometry. consider it, right? Consider what? We, we, didn't even have, we didn't even have to destroy it. Their own math destroyed their geometry. What's to consider in physical terms, Arwin? That they could think of the horizon as Earth curve? Yeah, but it isn't, because Earth curve would put its limitation at 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height in feet, and it isn't. So I no. know, but just because it isn't doesn't mean that you can't think of it as such. Yeah. Arwin's got a good point here because it crossed chocolate's point. Uh, because your response to Arvin was, it doesn't match the limitations set by R. We can't see the Earth curvature. But Arvin says, yeah, but you can think of it. And he's right. That's what they're all thinking. They're all thinking it is curved. Okay, by that standard, you can think that unicorns, farts, produce a layer that contains gas here. You can think that. You can think yes, a lot of that... things. But that's a very low standard, let's be honest. Yeah, it's not a... As he said, it's not true, but you can think of it. They want to live on the globe, Nathan. Let them. No, no. Let's get hold this clear. Right, no, 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 no. You can, hold on, hold on. Apologists for anti-flat Earth behavior. No, not at all. There is a clear, concise rhetoric in regards to what Earth curve is. It's the horizon at 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height in feet. It's a physical obstruction to your view. It's the thing that boats fall over according to Globe Earth Rhetoric. And there's no, well, it isn't, but I can still think of it as being something else. No, if you choose to think of it as anything other than a physical obstruction that we've debunked at 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height in feet, you're a heretic. That's well, it, that's I all you... That's why point. they don't. That's my point. They right? are anti Just because it isn't doesn't mean that you can't think of it as such. They have to. Otherwise, they, you become a heretic. Yeah, they being anti-flat earthers, are we? Right? They're on their no, own no, no. in their separated from globe earth rhetoric belief in that regard. There are a very small handful of people that know the globe no, I... doesn't work and still choose... Who's making that audio noise? It's Neil, of course. Neil! I don't know how I'm off you. Sorry. A small handful of people that have a different belief to the actual globe earth rhetoric. Now, when you say, and I, I, I want to focus on this, I'm not agitated with what you're saying, I'm glad you're saying it, because it get, gives me the opportunity to point out that anything that deviates from that makes you a heretic. There's not a fine line to toe. There's a clear, concise claim of sphericity. And that claim is a physical limitation to your view at 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height and feet, it's known as the horizon, and it is claimed to be a physical obstruction that blocks boats and buildings. Now, if you aren't in line with that, you're on your own in a separate fundamentalist religious belief that you've made up with maybe a few people around you arguing with flat earthers about how your individualistic ideas of what earth curve at the horizon is. That's not the globe earth belief. 
No, you're right. Yeah, but that, you're, but you're, you're bypassing my point, though, because that's exactly what I wasn't doing. What I was saying, like, no, they're not claiming it's something else. The real ballers have to hold on to the geometric consideration, even as the real world example is disproven through the black swan. They just have to forget about it or not you, touch you it. No, no, no. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> you know, at that point, you can appreciate that your faith in it has been tarnished, but express your faith beyond the contradiction to your faith. That's what you can do if you choose well, to. But Nathan, we're saying that it's almost the same thing. We're just creating a third category. There's the Globers who have to stick to the globe rhetoric. These aren't the people we're talking about because they would be uh, heretics. They'd be saying what I believe doesn't match up. But now if you say, but I still want to believe it, that's what the third category is the anti-flat earthers. They'll contradict their mother just to believe it. What? No, no, but that's... that's ah, this is getting confusing because I, th I think completely differently. I think that the anti-flat earthers are the ones that are trying to explain away why it doesn't seem to be geometric, and that's why they invented terrestrial refraction. Right. That's non-canon. But if they just ignore it and just say, no, it is it is geometric... Oh, I'm considering, I, I and anything. I will hold keep on. considering. Hold on. Hold on. Then they're ballers. Hold on, you said it was non-canon. Oh, did you want to add something, Adam? Sorry. Yeah, just, 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 no, just, because Alwyn's brilliant. Um, but after yesterday, where I thought we'd agreed the opposite, yeah. um, that was beautifully slipped in, Alwyn. Yes, nice I, I, that's why I, I stopped him in his tracks. Yes, yeah. Adam. Stop. <laughs> now, terrestrial refraction is very much canon. No, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. With respect to the target, that's canon. It's on screen now. I oh. know oh, it hasn't got refraction in this diagram. Needless to say, my point, which there is now go. veered onto refraction of targets with respect to the horizon. Oh, where's my where's my diagram gone? Oh. <laughs> Adam, put it back up, Adam. No, it's me. My presentation stopped. Resume your presentation. Obviously, something's gone strange with my. Um, I've, I know it's just carried on past the slide I was on. Oh, okay. It's me going nuts. In any event, Earth curve is Earth curve. If you want to refract targets, that's canon. If you want to refract the horizon, it isn't. Right, but that's actual refraction, right? This, Not terrestrial no. refraction. No, we've got in the old Mick West Matterbomb. Okay, so there's. Couple of additions he puts in, and um, one is the refracted horizon that was never in there before. It was always a geometric thing, and things were refracted with respect to it. Um, so that I would say is non-canon. I agree. So, yeah, I agree. Everything so else. Then was, terrestrial refraction but, isn't. No, no, no. no, no, no. But everything, everything else was refracted with seven over six R with respect to the horizon. That's why Riley had to lay down on the beach, yeah? That's why it was so important. That's why it was impossible for them, for those images that Riley got, to be achieved with him on his belly because the horizon was the geometric limitation. So he couldn't. There was not enough refraction. It was impossible for him to do it. Was it? That was their claim until he did it. Um, that's when Rumpus, and then it's after Mick West gets the battering that the horizon becomes refracted as well and it moves. At which point you don't have the physical geometry to assert that you've got a limitation in the Earth curve maths. Because what the Earth curve maths is attempting to prove, the clues in the title, is Earth curve. Well, the way they prove it is by how much it's blocked something in the distance. And they give you feet and inches values for how much they claim the horizon has blocked something in the distance. Now, when it doesn't quite work out, with how much it's blocked by Earth curve and its physicality, they refract the targets with respect to the Earth curve that the whole point of the maths is that it's trying to prove that the horizon's a physical limitation to your view. A hill called Earth curve. The moment you refract the Earth curve, what's your geometric limitation that's being proven when you go through this mathematical process? Well, there isn't one. Because the Earth curve that you're claiming, look, how much it's blocked this boat or building by... Well, no, it's no longer a physical limitation. It's a refracted position. 
that could be beyond the thing it's supposed to be blocking, making the entire claim absurd. So they've never got to the point where they refract the horizon as well. Otherwise, what are they proving? They're not proving Earth curve anymore. They're proving the horizon moves with the weather. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it becomes absurd. Not that it wasn't already. Okay, so then the anti-flat earthers have claimed that the horizon can be displaced and that the horizon basically isn't geometric, right? That's anti-flat earth claim. So there is sort of a terrestrial refraction that is canon, but it doesn't claim that the horizon is not the actual horizon. So it's like a middle road then that is still canon that but isn't effectively being applied. Well, your, right? your phraseology is just off slightly. do think that the Such horizon a... is displaced. Stop. Yeah, your, your phraseology is just off slightly. They're not trying to prove the horizon isn't the horizon or the horizon is the horizon. They're trying to prove the horizon is Earth curve, a physical limitation to your view, a tangent point to a sphere in geometric terms. That means it's got to be a tangent line to it when you describe it as a physical limitation. Now, this is why Rumpus wasn't allowed to return to the show, because he knew it full well while he was arguing for the limitation to your view at the horizon called Earth Curve, knowing damn well that it was a refracted non-geometric position. Well, that's just what he uses in his sleeve of magic tricks when he gets caught out with a black swan. Well, the horizon's refracted, so not blocking boats and buildings on the Isle of Man then. A non-physical position. We're not going to calculate how much it's blocked those buildings by. Oh, yeah, well, it was on that day. <laughs> yeah? No, that's not what he said. He said it was always refracted. In other words, he lied. He had no choice. But at the point that this rhetoric leaves you in the necessity to lie, it won't become canon and hasn't become canon. Mick West might have slipped it into his Earth Curve calculator, but it literally makes a farce of the claim you're making in the first instance. How are you proving that the Earth's a sphere? Well, because we've got an Earth curve limitation at the horizon. Oh, so it limits stuff. Yeah, unless it doesn't limit stuff and is beyond it. Ta-da! <laughs> doesn't quite work, does it? Right. Well, it can't be Earth curve either because you wouldn't be able to get angle measurements to derive the geometry to begin with. Well, I think I get it now. It's... So the original terrestrial refraction didn't attempt to suggest that the horizon was displaced, no. just everything else. And then the anti-flat earthers basically took it and kind of used it as a blunt weapon, even though it wasn't meant as such, against the black swan. Yes. And then topped it with the claim that the horizon itself also displays. And that's the terrestrial yes. refraction that we got to know, but it isn't the official one. Even. No, that's not the terrestrial refraction we got to know. A derivation huh. or bastardization of 7 over 6 are with respect to the horizon. These are geometric uh, utilizations of an R value that you can't acquire if you don't have a geometry to acquire it from. So the moment you bend the line to the horizon, it's no longer a tangent point, which destroys the geometry. Because that's what it's based on. It's based on Earth having a physical limitation at a tangent point. It's Earth curve geometry. Not Earth curve optics. Now, when they bait and switch you and go, well, optics come into effect. There are no optics in Earth curve maths. Well, I guess that I learned something new today. Do you want to, I you want to, the Earth. Terrestrial refraction. Did I quote Rumpus? Did I quote him already? Quote, you know it's refracted because of its position with respect to the horizon. End quote. That was during the Isle of Man discussion. Fast forward to 2021. I always said the horizon was refracted. Yet yeah, total lie. Right? You can't have it both ways. You know the target's refracted because it's positionally with respect to Earth curve I'm trying to prove versus Earth Curve, I'm trying to prove, can move around with the bloody weather. There's something else to... Uh, go ahead, after Mike 808 gets a shout-out. Thanks for the super chat. Go ahead, John. Um, well, Earth can't be curving because you need the angles to 
He did say, and we completely whistle past it. Flat. Any evidence you can acquire an elevation angle measurement from a curve baseline? John saying you can't have a curve baseline because where would you get angle measurements from? And he's right. This whole assertion of Earth having a sphere edge, which was a 2015, 16, 17 argument that then died on its ass, completely died on its ass and was buried completely in 2020, all require flat planes to make the assertion. Well, if you're going to have angles utilised, you're not going to have a curved surface to be getting them from. So Earth as a sphere violates the celestial sphere model. Want to add anything else to that, John? Excellent point. No, I mean, that's... That's kind of it. Going to need a flat plane, folks. You can't assert Earth curve. It violates the celestial sphere model. In fact, your Earth curve assertion and presupposition that violates the celestial sphere model was derived from the celestial sphere model and flat planes that made it. Nathan, can you ask David, David, if I can have that three Bitcoin? It's obvious no globe believer will be able to claim it. Just look at the clowns we have in the chat. Thank you for the super chat, Godzilla. Um, no, I'm not going to ask Dave Weiss for three Bitcoin. If I did, it'd probably make him cry going on the prices of Bitcoin at the moment. So any evidence we can acquire an elevation angle from a curved baseline? Well, if you could, you wouldn't need all these horizontal planes and tangent planes and all these flat surfaces that all these guys that believe we live on a spherical surface uh, keep bringing up. So, obviously, we don't need the ball, the little dingleberry that's sitting underneath a horizontal plane. We don't need that. And they don't need that. <laughs> so, there you go. Yep. A Kumo virus yesterday in the chat was saying, oh, yeah, no, I can... Uh... I can do that. And then I, when I asked the question specifically, so how do you attain that elevation angle with a, uh, yeah, with a curved baseline? And then he just kept rolling around it. Like he was going to answer it. I asked it three times. And then at the end, he said, like, why would I answer that? <laughs> like that uh, right. Yep. Because he said he could do he it. He always... He, he always does that. He he says stuff to... Oh, here he goes again. You know, in well, hang on. He says stuff to mock us. Then we say, all right, I'll give him one more chance. Okay. Virus, what about this? And then he says, what? And then he then he goes about five, you know, different, you know, typings. And then finally he says, why would I ever answer that? He just plays around. He's He's, he's a joke. Remember how direct Zanuck was when I asked him? When I said, uh, what, what if we wanted to switch it up and use the sphere first? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I just assume a flat plane. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we've got to assume a flat plane. Yeah. Even if you want to use the sphere first? Yeah, we got to use a flat plane. Oh, okay. Which you wouldn't have on a spherical surface, but okay. No problem. Lower. Yeah, and, and when he says that, Chocolate, he doesn't realize what he's really admitting to, that the GP of the star, sun, or moon, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, whatever the radius distance is from the first circle of, of equal altitude, that's on that flat plane all the way to you at your zenith position as the observer. It, it, it's like they admit to it, then they'll realize, uh-oh. So Gene has a question. Says, you... says Globies on TikTok are eating your lunch. Average 600 to 1300 viewers. No. <laughs> but thank you for the super chat. No. I mean, if you see a, a, a your average Globe Believer video will do 10x what any video I ever produce ever will do. You know, my best video on my best day got less than 100,000 views. That's my most popular video. So your average guy talking about how he feels about a picture of the earth rise nonsense that'll get you a million views so just because globers are doing really well on tiktok i don't know i've looked into it jean i still don't think it's the right time to to move to tiktok i've got to be honest but i, I do periodically look at it like i said last time but i appreciate your super chat i really really do thank you very much indeed tiktok is very strict really going to be hard 
I haven't looked at their regs and rules. I haven't got that far. I don't know how strict they are. That's something I would definitely take into consideration before I did anything. But at this stage, it's like, is it going to be worthwhile? At the moment, I don't think so. Um, that may change. Like I say, I periodically look at, look at TikTok and other platforms as well. Um, not that I can promote them here. You get banned from YouTube if you promote people to go to other platforms. As it should be, you know, you want to retain your audience on your website and that's what YouTube are doing. They say, no, if you're on here using our, our facilities to make money and make us money and, and advertise us money and all the rest of it, then that cog needs to keep turning on our page, not on someone else's. So there we go. Anyway, yeah, I say it one more time. Thank you very much for the super chat. Really appreciate it. Jean. They, they can't truly um, delete flat earth from history because without it, they don't have a globe. You can't erase the reality of reality. If they did well, absolutely they nothing, people would eventually f figure it out of their own volition. I just think that's the way it is. Shout out to Hillside. He says, flat baseline. Quote, it's not an assumption. It's a prerequisite. End quote. Nathan Oakley. Definitely one of my favourite quotes. Oh, well, thank you very much. Really appreciate the support. Thank you very much for the super chat, Hillside. Sorry, John. You continue. My bad. I was saying that the globe is a flat earth religion. It requires a flat earth. They can't get rid of flat earth. They can't make flat earth illegal to talk about or their religion is in trouble. I don't know if history is true, then maybe they can. And where will they get their angle measurements for their globe? I have to ponder this for a few seconds. Uh, I answered that in the pre-show presentation, where they get it from. Yeah, they get it from a plane. I appreciate that. I'm, what, what John's saying, though, is it's they, they lack the ability to punish us. So they can suppress us, but they can't punish us. Because if they're punishing us, they're... I don't know, biting the hand that feeds them is the right way of phrasing it. But if you're... As the Super Chat just quoted me on if you have a prerequisite to get angles from a flat plane then the flat plane's a necessity part a necess necessary what's the word necessary part of your model so you can't persecute somebody for saying well the prerequisite section of your model was flat and i, I just leave the rest of it <laughs> you know because i don't need it plus it makes a complete mockery of the angle measurement <laughs> So they can't well, John is the flat, flat Earth is the necessary antecedent to the globe. Yeah. yeah, that's what John. That's what John is saying. It's the original canon for it. Yeah, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. Like I say, I have to ponder this for a little while because we are certainly suppressed. But no, nobody's ever been punished, and I've I've highlighted that on many of occasions when people talk about us being, uh, choose my words carefully, censored. And I say, well, not necessarily. And then I'll give a, a load of examples of where we're not censored and a comparison where somebody is very specifically censored and then a rule change will even be introduced in YouTube to stop them talking about a very specific thing in a very specific way. And if they do, they get banned, they get removed, they are censored in a very real way. We haven't suffered that. I've suffered attacks. The channels have suffered major attacks in the past i've been under copyright strikes 20 fold from people attacking me now, that's not youtube doing that that's just assholes doing that that don't want me here because we because we are showing where their globe's wrong and they don't like it but that doesn't mean that i feel like i'm actually being censored like the channel's shut down because i've said the earth's flat i don't feel that there's any um beyond the perception that some might have there's any actual consequences to saying that you might be ridiculed by your fellow man but it's just some next man that's your neighbor right being a, a neighborly type that doesn't mean that you're not allowed to do it and i don't think we are not allowed to do it i wouldn't be yes claiming it's an evergreen topic that we'll always be able to talk about every day of the week and we do if it wasn't an evergreen topic that we are allowed to talk about so i think john's right They can't get rid of us without getting rid of themselves. John's right, but the the problem is most normies wouldn't aren't ready for that chapter of the conversation. 
Most of them aren't even ready to understand that their geometric horizon, AKA the earth curve, it's not a geometric location. It's not a physical obstruction to their view. It's just a, an apparent location. They, they're not ready for that. So it's, how are they gonna be ready for your entire heliocentric model came from elevations taken off the flat horizontal plane? Chocolate just said you're not ready for is the statement as follows. The horizon is not Earth curve. Is Adam still here? He's on the panel. Yeah, exactly. They're not ready for that. Because <laughs> I get people that look at me with like I have three heads when I say that. Because they, most of them don't even understand that the horizon is supposed to be the Earth curve. You have to get to that before you can even explain to them how it's not the Earth curve. So then when I, and I've said it to a couple of my coworkers, you know, the entire globe came from elevation angles taken off a flat plane. And they look at me like I have six heads then. I'm like, all right, all right, I know. I get it. You're not ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you put in tip of the spear arguments to normies. I, I, it does sound amusing. Oh, it is. It is. The, We're here. The we don't need I to. Get. <laughs> we don't need to concern great. ourselves. I appreciate the, 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 the information being disseminated from your experience. That's wonderful. But by the same token, here, right here, right now, with however many hundred, over a hundred people watching, woohoo! Um, we don't have to concern ourselves with that. I don't think we will ever be put in front of the normies ever again. Just like, here's Flat Earth. What, like, you might be interested in these cat videos. Or you might be interested in what was I offered recently by YouTube. Some law related stuff. You know, it, that's just never going to happen. So we don't have to concern ourselves that the, the, the tip of the spear arguments are going to be over the head of the normies. I know I sometimes try and dumb it down and I pretend that it's because there might be normies here. It's just because some people won't understand, regardless if they're normies or not. It's complicated. Well, the stuff, horizon, the, if, if I may, the horizon is either geometric or optical. And since John has already said, um, again elevation angle measurement uh, destroys the sphere model then it must be optical it can't be geometric and their model's only well, geometric there's only one claim of what the earth curve edge horizon is caused by and that's the physical earth curve geometry well that's nothing to do with optics and everything to do with feet and inches values in muppet vision orthographic view not receding into the distance staying the same fixed size, and then the only reason they ever disappear is because of Earth geometry, physical tangent points called Earth curve getting in the way. That's their only assertion. So there are no optics, as I said earlier, maybe in the pre-show. There's no optics in Earth curve maths. The targets don't change size with distance. That's optics. That doesn't happen. So when they start talking about refraction and refractive effects in optics, it's like... You, you, your earth curve maths doesn't have optics. It's Muppet vision. You see in the side of your own head, that's nothing to do with what I see with my eye. But in the real world, not their world, but the real world, especially myself, because I did have a boat for two and a half years and was on the Pacific Ocean weekly, uh, going to Catalina and other fishing areas. I, sometimes I saw really far, sometimes not too far, sometimes fogged in, couldn't see much at all. Uh, so what in my real world experience with my real world eyes, I see a horizon that's changing distances based on weather. Notice audience what he didn't say is another one of those times of appealing as though there's normies. He didn't say sees too far. He said, sometimes I see really far. He didn't say too far. Now, I highlight this because some people on the flat earth side of the argument will assert that we see too far. Indicating to me and everyone on this panel that they've got a presupposition of a sphere earth that they're not relinquishing, even though they claim to be a flat earther. Because too far implies that there should be an earth curve limitation at the horizon, a physical limitation to block your view. So when that's not being blocked, it's too far? No. No. I don't work under the presupposition that I'm going to have a limitation to my view called Earth Curve. Therefore, when I see really far, I just go, wow, I can see really far. Not, oh my God, Earth Curve hasn't got in the way because it should have. No. Just want to point out Tenth Man's exceptionally good phraseology. 
Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Hang on, hang on, hang on before you go. Alan, you want to show the six slides I sent you at this point on the offing? It's probably Maybe a good pertinent place to cover them. Let me just move me screen. Sorry, Nathan, but this this is really good based on what we're talking about. Um, it should be there now. Okay, it's on screen. Uh, the one I sent you, Adam, to your uh, Skype. Those I went over in the pre-show. All right, wait there, man. Oh, God, it's all going wrong. No, it's okay. Oh, it's it's okay. all falling apart. Let's just end it all. Let's just shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Go ahead, Adam. So the offing. I like this because this was just built on what we found out. So offing. The deep, distant stretch of the ocean that is still visible from the land. And we remember that the offing is also synonymous with the horizon, that it's specifically the darker line, I think. Um, so I like that again, because again, it's describing that the sea is visible. Feedback from this guy. Another one. Offing, adjective. The area of the sea in which a ship can be seen in the distance from land. That be equivalent to it sitting on the horizon. It's in the offing. I think there's another one that, that sums up the, the phrase very nice, doesn't it? Here we go. This phrase first appeared in the 16th century. The offing is the more distant part of the sea visible from the shore. It is a safe distance from land for a ship and is generally water that is too deep to anchor in. Something in the offing is impending, about to arrive or likely to happen. A like on the horizon in the offing is what we used to call um, back in the days of the Isle of Man, the circle of confusion. Ether band, ether band, <laughs> right? There's loads of names for it, but yeah, Is that the, di the dirty air, yeah. dirty, dirty air. air, yeah. There's another one. All of these things only have one assertion in the Earth curve mathematics. Do you know what the only assertion in the Earth curve mathematics is? Uh, Earth curve. Earth curve. curve. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. There's only one claim: physical geometric the... limitation. To your view, go on. Where, where's the offing here in this uh, two platforms? From Miramar Beach, where's the offing? I've, I've got okay. it in decent picture on my screen, so yeah, just, let, just let me answer there, Adam. Thing. Hold on. So, in this picture of the black swan, the horizon itself is beyond the two oil rigs, so there. it's kind of a other way around situation. The oil rigs aren't in the offing; they're no. physically visible in their entirety beyond the limitation that they would be claimed to be blocked by if the Earth was a sphere with a physical limitation. So they should be in the offing. <laughs> They're not. When when BLMB um, does the video and zooms in, as you zoom in, there will be a point where they are in the offing. And as you continue to zoom in, the offing will move back. Um, meaning they're not in the offing anymore. They're in the foreground. Um, and as you can see in this picture, the offing is right where my cursor is here. Look, if I go across, you can see the rough horizon. It's better on the contrasted one. But you can see that the offing is is way into the distance. The visible sea is way off into the distance. How off is it in the next picture? Before you go to the next picture, an example of the offing would be the Isle of Man from... Anthony Riley's belly on the beach at about 36 miles distance. You can just make it out coming in and out of the horizon. So it's obviously something there. It's obviously land, but it's obviously not close to you. No, and it flickering a bit because it's in the offing. Yeah. Yeah. Just an old fashioned term that means stuff that you can kind of make out in the distance. Well, kind What's... of making stuff out in the distance is repurposed as being physically blocked by an earth curve edge limitation, geometric in nature, at the horizon. Yeah. 
what, what what's important is it's not describing is this old phrase is is preclusive of any attribution to to curvature or obstruction look it's describing what it is it's a it's a word that has a lot of meaning and it's continued in time so it's why they've had to abandon it the deep distant stretch of the ocean that is still visible yeah well the, these things if we go to the black swan uh, what a gloriously clear day for how much is still visible that is not commensurate with any form of ball mathematics though uh, but like i said the the phrase itself is stating that it's it's a flat plate I and mean, it's not obvious but within the inference of it it is a flat plane because it's just describing the the rest of the land uh, the rest of the sea that can be seen it's still there still there and you can just about make it but it's it's still there in that zone the rest of that plane is in that offing go to that next picture tenth not seeing this you'll have to Mitchell put this. Yeah, Mitchell put There's this. Mitchell one from out. Australia. Subscribe today to Mitchell from Australia. I want to explain what this is. There's going to be people who haven't got a clue what's on screen right now. Well, basically, he's got uh, the Anacapa arch and rock in the top left. Uh, and then this shot uh, shows left of platform grace is that same Anacapa arch and rock right there to the left. Now that should not be seen whatsoever, but it's being seen. So because of the optics of the camera being better than the eye, the offing is way beyond the platform and right where these rocks are. I'll see it now, yeah. So we, you then use the the back calculation, like with the uh, the black swan, for a new radius of 1.77 million miles, because uh, we're able to put that offing at, at least a distance of 31. So if we are going to play ball, uh, and you are going to ascribe the offing as your geometric limitation to your ball, um, and the implication at this point would be your radius value would jump from 3959 miles to 1.77 million miles. Yeah, just a bit outside. <laughs> Shout out to Godzilla37. Bet you can't answer what is more likely, Phil is a teacher or Earth is a globe? Phil, as in Prof Phil Bell, I'm pretty sure Phil's taught. I believe him when he tells me that he's taught at various different universities. Why wouldn't I believe him in that regard? Godzilla. Thank you for the super chat, though. I don't think people are so brazen. Some people are. Psychopaths. Anyway, thank you for the super chat. I think, I think the sentiment from Godzilla is based on the answers he gives to the questions we pose, and since they're funny or non sequitur or doesn't, I mean, just doesn't jive with reality. He's saying, how could someone like that be a professor? Well, there's tons of these people out there who actually believe what they're saying, even though it doesn't jive with reality. Let's move on. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? There is um, an angular size measurement of the sun. And is angular size uh, measurement part of the globe mass, Nathan? No. Oh. They have a no, single, so line, that be means single line between observer and target. And you can't get angles from single lines. So that means that a sun having an angular size on a globe earth is impossible then, yes? Um. Yeah, I guess so. Well, an angular size would be an elevation angle, wouldn't it? If you're just measuring the angular well, size, you could just measure the its size in the sky and give it in radians, though, couldn't you? Yeah. No, but you need to. You, you no, you're missing the point. For something to have an angular size, it means that the perspective needs to be a reality. 
In the context of globe earth mathematics and their association with distant targets, those distant targets, when talking about earth curve and its physical composition that they claim with Muppet Vision, then no, there's no perspective in earth curve mathematics. Further to that, you can't have perspective when you're utilising the celestial sphere model and just acquiring an angle from a flat plane. That's the only claim of a perspective drop if you want to call the sun's movement towards the horizon a perspective drop. But you're specifically talking about taking just an angular size. I mean, I can give the size in arc seconds or I can give it in all sorts of different degree measurements. If I just take that in isolation, I can just measure its angle in the sky, can't I? I don't follow your point. No, in the maths, can't. There isn't. Not on the globe, you can't. Not, Not the in the their paradigm, in their, in their mathematical paradigm of distant objects. You're correct. It's quite speci it's no. hyper specific, though, isn't it, Brian? Uh, yeah, global maths are all orthographic maths. Not there's no per frontal perspective global maths. All the frontal perspective is all flat out perspective. But okay. they were the uh, yeah. flat perspective at one time. Said like that it's with the disclaimer. perspective. There so, is no. Yeah, you've got to say it with the disclaimers, though. So you've got to say, in the uh, orthographic world of Earth curve. There is no angular size measurement. Well, that's the point. If the sun has an angular size, then it's not a globe. Because the globe uh, mathematic think... state, just one second to talk about, because the globe mathematic state that it can't have. Go on, Doctor. No, I was just going to say that's, that's why you fixed it with uh, it. On the globe, you can't have angular size. <laughs> No, you can't. You can't have angles. Angles are, uh, when we measure with angles to anything, whether it be an angular size or the celestial body or whatever, now I'm not talking about slicing a cake, right? I'm talking about measurements in reality, right, of the earth and things that we see, right? We are using frontal perspective. We are measuring perspective with those angles. Angles measure perspective. There is no perspective on the globe. The origin of the globe started with flat earth elevation angles to Polaris. So they could come up with an orthographic explanation as to why Polaris rises and drops in the sky. So, Nathan, does Polaris rise and drop in the sky due to perspective or earth call? Gotcha. Because it can't be both. I, I, I've got perfect. We, I don't know if you're here in the pre show when 10th had this last diagram. It's the last diagram in Master B. I'm just going to stick it up on screen for the audience and get rid of the chat. Um, so. Have you, can you see this image, Brian? Uh, no, but I go to Master B, Nathan. Okay, so in Master B, you've got this this picture of where you take your angle from the centre of the celestial sphere model with an angle marked out. And then they have a tangent plane sat on the top of it with a local angle to a flat plane measured with respect to the zenith moving to the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth. Bit of a mouthful, but that's what the diagram depicts in two different places. Well... Both are orthographic. That's the only way you can do this, right? The way that you can bastardise this flat Earth measurement is in an orthographic view. What Brian's saying is when you draw out these angles side on, yeah, there is no second line. So I'm going to highlight this on the zenith on the left-hand diagram. So if you say, let's just say for the sake of argument that you're stood at this position in the globe Earth paradigm, right, as they're depicting it in Muppet Vision. Well, in this diagram, you've got a line from your position to the zenith let's say that the sun is at your zenith yeah well that's a single line in this depictoral example there's not two lines going out to the zenith if the sun was there and they can't have because all of these celestial bodies are placed in this muppet vision at an infinite distance why well because there is no perspective to account for you just have one line so what brian's saying is the world of sphere earth mathematics always takes place in orthographic view as does the celestial sphere model probably no coincidence and it all works fine until you appreciate that that excludes all aspects of perspective because there's only one line going out to whatever you're measuring so again in this oh here we go celestial north pole yeah so let's say that that's polaris yeah on this left hand diagram well, if you're drawing a line out to Polaris to measure an angle against this local baseline, that's a single line to Polaris. Not an angular size acquirable from that. It's one line. 
Right, Brian? And you can't have two lines. It's Muppet vision. You're not going to get angular representations out of this. If you draw the sun in the diagram, it would be about here on the top of this dome that's got a local flat plane attached to it that's got a local flat plane from the celestial sphere model. Lots of local flat planes going on. Anyway, right, if you drew the north star in this diagram, let's say I draw it where there's a H of north, so you've got celestial north pole. Where H is, let's say that that's the depictoral example of, of Polaris, right? Well, you could draw it there, or you could draw it completely off the page. It wouldn't make any difference because you've only got one line to it. But if I do draw it here, and I draw it really big, I'll draw a really big Polaris. Yeah, it doesn't matter because you've only got one line going to it. You're not going to suddenly have a really wide line and a second really wide line for the angle to it. That's not possible in orthographic, which is where the globe takes place. So, excellent point, Brian. It's it's out, it's been about four weeks for you trying to drive this point home. I finally got it. <laughs> I told QE it takes me about ten times. He didn't believe me. Well, the thing about it is, Nathan, if you look at that diagram, you take any orthographic diagram where they show a globe, and if they put in a star, and especially if they label the star as one of the known stars, it's not just a random star, but if they call it Polaris or whatever, that star will be small. So they are adding in an angular size change to a star within their orthographic diagram that it can't have. But they're adding it in because in reality, we see a small light, right? Now, with that small light, you can make all kinds of claims of what size and distance it is. But the point is, is that that's just speculation. It, within their orthographic uh, model, they sh can never show you an, a star being small. Like when they, if they put a little star up above that globe there that we have there in orthographic view, like what is that star? It's not what they claim it to be because it can't be, because it can't have an angular size. Everything globe, everything starts with the rise and fall drop rate of Polaris. That's where it was after that the whole 7 over 6R and all this other stuff had to come into it because they needed to keep, you know, uh, us looking, when we're looking out to sea in other places, they needed to hijack as many things as possible, visual and refractive effects and uh, just, just optical effects as much as possible to keep people believing it's a globe. When in, in reality, what started the whole globe thing was flatter elevation angles to Polaris. That's why Polaris rises and falls. It's either earth, earth curve or perspective. It's one or the other. And they have to put it into orthographic view to make it earth curve. But then you can't have an angular size of Polaris or the sun or anything else. Nothing has angular size. Perspective does not exist. I know it's kind of simplistic, so it's hard to get, get across to people. Come on. No, no, I, lo I, I love it when you first came out with it. I just want to go back to this illustration that Nathan has up. In, so this is Earth, and then they've got the snow globe on top of Earth, two different versions of the snow globe. Look at the snow globe where the equator is on both and look at the Earth's equator, they match. The North Pole on both is straight up. The celestial North Pole is them saying the light comes in parallel. But if you were just to look at the celestial equator, which is from Earth's surface to infinite distance, well, there is no distance. You have to imagine the celestial sphere infinite distance away and the stars all on the inner concave part of it. Okay, so they're directly over every part of this. So well, all they did here was take the flat plane and move it on top of a circle. Right. Any more on this? Yeah. <clears throat> If you think about the claim of parallel light rays, <clears throat> that specifically requires something to be of a specific size at a specific distance, doesn't it? It means, you know, it has to be a specific size at a specific distance. And that's all back calculated from their original observation, from the original flat earth elevation angles uh, of Polaris rising and appear, appearing to rise and fall in the sky. But at that point, there is no angular size change, but there is angular size change when there needs to be for them. They switch between the two, even with the orthographic view, they put in a little star up above, up, up the left of their little globe in the diagram. No, that star can't be little. 
that star has to be a billion times the size of your globe in the diagram. Your globe should be tiny and that star should be huge if you want to do it that way. Because everything has to be its actual size in comparison to everything else. So when we look in the sky, if we're on a globe, the sun should be huge, Polaris should be massive, everything should be, should be all these big, massive, huge things in the sky. That's what we should be seeing if it was a globe. I know it's, it sounds crazy and ridiculous, but these are the actual geometric facts. I'm sorry. As it didn't get answered, any evidence of the distance to the sun? No. Any scientific evidence of gravity? Hang on, hang on, hang on. The distance to the sun is a back calculation from the angular size. You can take any claim they make about size and distance to the sun, and you can always turn it back into its angular size that we see. They can take the angular size, something that can't exist on their globe, and claim the size and distance to the sun with it by back calculation. It all started with an angular size measurement, something impossible on their model. There is no perspective, there is no angles, they don't exist. It can't exist, because perspective doesn't exist. You can't measure perspective that doesn't exist. With angles, they can't exist. The, the distance and size of their sun is all back calculated from an angular size of the sun in our sky, an average angular size throughout a 12 month period. You can make the sun any size and distance you want based off that angular size. That's all that's going on there. So no, there is absolutely no evidence of the distance to the sun. Sorry about that. That's okay. Can I can I change the topic slightly? Because someone in the chat about 10 minutes ago said 1,000 likes incoming because the likes are out of whack again. Well, I, I re-looked at why this might be happening and I think I found my answer. So you can purchase likes and likes are really expensive to purchase from what I've turned over with my research on this subject. Unlike subscribers, which from what I can establish, I don't know why, are much, much cheaper. I think what they try and do is rope you into buying subscribers, because that's the bit that most people are vain about. And then when people color or spot the fact that you haven't got the interaction that you're supposed to have with the number of subscribers that you've got, they start buying likes, the people that buy them, not me. Anyway, that leads me to what the people who sell likes do to get around the algorithm. What they will do is they will spam like the person that's paid for likes, but also subscribe to and like other channels that are semi-associated with that channel. So if there's a similar type of channel with a similar type of audience base, the person that sold the likes and is therefore farming them or whatever they call it when they're going out and spamming their client's video with likes, so that they don't get caught, they'll spam other videos around it, which also then end up with random spammed likes so that they're not so obvious in what they're doing when they're selling these likes to these idiots that are so vain they want to just boost their numbers with no real attachment to any decent statistics. So given that, number one, I'm not buying the likes, and number two, this is the only bit I'm a bit grey area on, I can't imagine that somebody out there would want to purchase likes for this channel. So as much as... That could be a possibility, it seems very unlikely. It leaves me with the only other option, which is that there's somebody else out there in this neck of the woods that is buying likes and is buying subscribers, and when they are doing so at a considerable cost that I certainly wouldn't hand over for that stupid nonsense, they are also spam-liking my channel. And to somebody who's out in the Far East doing this, they're not going to care that there's a massive dismatch in my ratios to likes to live viewers, so long as they fulfil whatever they're person at the hierarchy of their office says go out and spam like these videos because they're getting paid to do so so that is from research into other people that have found that are on youtube that have been looked into and other platforms for that matter i think the the one that gave me the most information was some model on instagram i believe and she ended up having something like a million subscribers but was getting like 0.01 percent likes or hearts or whatever it is they have on Instagram, I don't really know. Um, but in any way, uh, people could spot from that disparity that obviously that there were fake subscribers. So I think that the people selling them have played on that idea and then they make the likes and interaction much, much more expensive. 
Uh, like I say, to not get caught out, they'll spam people around them with likes, which is why my videos end up with stupid numbers of likes. Now, so long as it's just likes, to be honest, I don't really look at the likes or dislikes. I've, I never have. I've never really paid them much consideration, and I don't think they're that important because um, anybody can come along and like you. And in this instance, people can come along and spam like you, making it completely meaningless. Um, but when it does, when my view figures get distorted, I get quite angry. I have in the past when I'm like, woohoo, there's like 250 people watching. Hang on a minute. The chat rate's still only 18 chats per minute. Hmm, that's wrong. Hmm, that's annoying. Hmm, that's going to throw my statistics out. Whereas with the likes, I'm like, oh, who cares? So long as it doesn't cause me any detriment, I, YouTube, don't look over me going, oh, is he doing something dodgy? Because I'm not. Um, but people have accused me of it, so that's why I've dedicated this much time to this particular section. People in the comments will come well, along and go, oh, you're buying likes. No. Well, don't, uh, don't blame me because I don't like spam. I don't like spam either. It ruins my statistics. But the likes, I don't care about in statistical terms, so I, I get less annoyed by it. Uh, unless it causes me some detriment with YouTube, which hopefully they're more wise to it than me having to do a a fair bit of research i would hope youtube are way ahead of me on that in that regard um but it's just an explanation that i feel like needs to be given because it's about the sixth or seventh time it's happened and you're like hmm first couple of times i just wave them away you make a minor mental note of it by about the sixth or seventh time it happens you're like i've got to figure out what's going on here there's something very wrong and there's got to be an explanation i don't like not knowing why something like that occurs because it's not just a glitch um, but yeah, as I say, I think it is just down to somebody, God knows who, I'm never going to figure that out, uh, has bought subscribers and has subsequently gone, mm, look, my interaction's still really low. <laughs> I'll buy a load of likes. <laughs> okay. Well, good for you, whoever you are. And good for you, whoever's selling them. More power to you if it makes you, you know, pay the bills. But the point I'm going to make in this regard for people who accuse me of buying them, I'm here to make a living. So... The idea of spending the money I get in on false views is absurd. Because what I want to do is increase the views, because that will increase the money that comes in. So there's no way that that's ever going to go the other direction. The, the, the street comes towards me for money. That's that's I'm here for a living. So I'm never going to reverse the direction of that flow of money back towards YouTube. Sorry, YouTube. <laughs> but no. And even in this instance, it's not even YouTube that are getting the money out of this. It's just some guys in the Far East. Um, from what I can ascertain, it might be some other part of the world. But my point is the right. same. Um, you know, in case anyone thinks I'm pouring scorn on the Far East, I'm not. I'm just saying that somebody somewhere is is charging for this service, and so they don't get caught, they random spam like other channels that aren't directly the only channel, because presumably they get caught out if only one channel has only that 4,000 random accounts only subscribed to that one channel. It's presumably much more obvious for you to catch them out. So, like I say, that's... So that was an hour or two of research that I'll never get back just so I could explain this to my audience who occasionally leave comments going, huh, buying likes. N no, I I'd rather buy food for my children. Definitely not. Anyway, that's enough for that rant. Right, and it, it yeah, wouldn't work problem. anyway as a flat earther, right? Because we are getting uh, cut down. We are getting gatekept by Google. So buying from them is not going to yield what it normally would if you were free, right? Because, hey, you as some random YouTuber about a non-scary subject, right? You could do that and then and then like really grow out very quickly. And it works because they're not being gatekept. But for us, that doesn't work at all. Yeah. Well, what I would say about it is I understand, Nathan, that you're very specific about your, uh, about your statistics because you want to be able to know and you want to be able to rely on the statistics uh, statistics uh, for to know exactly how many how many views you're getting and what is the watch time and you know, all those things. So you don't want some nonsense that you can't actually uh, you know you can't actually rely on rely upon. Right, I get that, but I think that you end up explaining it to the audience because over the years you have so many ballers attacking you with false claims that you're doing this and you're doing that. So you instantly feel the need to explain yourself to your audience because you're expecting attack from the ballers claiming that you're buying likes or you're doing this or you're, you're doing that. You don't need to do that anymore. 
Who cares what they think? They're going to they buy likes just so they can attack you with it. It means nothing. Who cares what these losers think? They don't matter. I couldn't give a damn what they say about me. You know, w- within reason. No, no, I like your attitude. Oh, yeah, it's, I yeah. completely, completely agree. And your attitude I love, and it's rubbing off on me. I've got to be honest, Brian. So, But on that note, I have got to round out this live show. So with that, I'm going to say, first and foremost, huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's live show possible. If you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams, stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. Unfortunately, though, if you are watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. Another massive thank you to all of you who smashed the super chat, liked, commented, shared, subscribed, joined as a member, and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I will see you all in the next video. drill down on your point about perspective not being possible with angular size on the globe. Well, if we start with the distance to the sun, I can take an angular size measurement of the sun and then make whatever claim I want about its size and distance. And I can also then do the same with the moon. If I start with the sun, I could then do the same thing with the moon and make sure that my calculation fits what size the moon should be in comparison to the sun within my model. All I've got, though, are angular size measurements. And how did I get them if we're on a globe? We can't be. We can't get those things on a globe. They don't exist. Globe mathematics are orthographic mathematics. They have to be. Because they have to show how Polaris appears to rise and drop due to somebody going back down over or up over Earth core. Right. You know, so they're asserting you moving around on the protractor. The protractor's twisting with you watching it drop. You've got to represent that in orthographic view. You can't depict it or describe it in an optical view because it isn't an optical view. The optical view was the angular me- measurement. That's the relationship with the horizon. Now, that's still perspective, though, isn't it, Brian? It's the same hijacking that we noticed four or five years ago with the curve calculator. It just runs through the entire paradigm is, I think, the overarching point that you're trying to make. This doesn't just extend to the Earth curve horizon. It extends to all of it. There's no perspective in globe Earth world. Their maths doesn't have it. Yeah, you were more right You know what, you though? Sorry, bro. Just very quickly, Chocolate. I just want to say to Nathan, Nathan, you were more correct than you realized back then. If you think about your, I know, add in the hijacking as opposed to omitted, like QE said, about the Earth uh, calculator, you are so correct, more correct. It's like, it's so simple, but the simple things are the hard things to spot, you know, or to, to latch on to, to, give con- to be confident about. You know, that's the problem. It's like the horizon argument. People weren't confident about it until QE made a proper argument out of it in 2020. But it's been five years of us not being confident about it. Well, we, some of us used it, but not as a, not as a group. You know, Sorry, Chocolate. No, I was going to say your point's beautiful. And that actually, it, it makes it a lot more, it, it makes sense as to why when, when we first, or when I first got into this, they used to fight so hard. And he would even make fun of us when we would talk about perspective, right? Because they used to, I mean, yeah, we got called, you know, flurfers using perspective and, you know, perspective doesn't exist except in drawings and shit like that. And I used to be like, well, what the hell are they talking about? How do you not include perspective into anything that's (laughs) seeing something? What the hell is going on? But Uh, now it actually, yeah, yeah. Remember that? They used to make fun of us. They were so confident, right? 
like, oh, you have nowhere to go. You just made this up, didn't you, Flat Earther? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's probably because of what Brian is saying. Because maybe they knew or they somewhat understood that, no, they, you can't have perspective on the globe. It can't be working that way. But now, years later, six, seven years later, now they have to talk about perspective because now they have things they can't ignore, like the loss of their geometry. So now they have to come up with something else. <laughs> it, it's hilarious to me, man. But it makes sense. But they all... Sorry, I've gotten on in at the end of uh, chocolates. No, you're good, uh, they, bro. You're good. They, they always um, tell you where the weaknesses are by how aggressive they get about something. Yep. How, how bad uh, they fight against it, right? Remember, shh, don't talk about 90. What, but, why? And the Black Swan. <laughs> what, uh, what? Loads, several people came forward after the Black Swan was formulated into Moses Holands uh, and made a comment specifically about how their horizons beyond Earth curve limitations got the most horrendous vitriol from globe believers. Like people were idiotic. And like you say, it's a tell. Same goes for their um, uh, straw men arguments. They're a tell. Like saying the boats fall over the edge of the sphere disk. Not sphere disk, the flat plane disk. It's like you've got boats falling over your horizon. So you challenge us to prove why boats are falling off the edge of our disk you straw man us with. Like their, their weakest sections are the most telling. And when they attack you with the most vitriol, it's the most telling. I think it was Robin Poe that said, oh, no, it was Paula. So when you're over the target, that's when you get the most flack. Well, it's true. I don't know, Nathan. They say that they don't like when you say boats fall over the edge. They'd rather you say boats disappear into other horizons. But boats but are going see, over Earth curve edge. They would, the anti flat earthers would rather we didn't label it in the absurd way that it actually suggests because boats are falling over Earth curve. Now, they don't like that because suddenly it makes them cringe because they've been asking us to prove why boats fall... Do boats fall over the edge of your pink pizza pie? That's what they ask us, right? So boats fall over your earth curve? No, 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 disappear into the... No, fall over earth curve. Here's your maths for how much it's fallen over earth curve, you stupid muppet. Well, uh, you if have you... To make them... Sorry, go on, John. I was just going to say you have to make them think you're strong or you're weak. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what they do. Because that's what they did with the horizon. That's what they did with with everything. With uh, with, with every argument that they failed on, but the worst. They always well, tried to make it feel, seem like they were the strong. That was their strongest point. Yeah. That. Where's your Low dome? Tactics. Prove your dome. Show me a dome. Why do they say that? Because they require containment to have the gas pressure they're breathing in violation of natural law. So they challenge flat earthers to prove a dome. It's a preemptive projection attack. Yep. Precisely. Well put. For, for, sorry, Armin, say that again because I want to. said it's a preemptive <laughs> projection attack. Exactly. Yeah, very true. Yeah, perfect. Can, can, we, do a can we do a test <laughs> right now? Uh, what, what, <laughs> well, oh, oh, Hold on, Brian's at the end of this point. Go, He's getting go, frustrated. Brian. Just let Brian get to the end. Go on, Brian. Yeah, just very quickly, just for chocolate. Chocolate. Uh, we live, according to the globe model, in a solar system, which means the globe Earth and all these other planets go around the sun, which is a star, and all the other stars are, are stars as well. All the other things are stars as well of different compositions. But what started all that? For the people you work with, you can take an angular measurement to the sun, but... There is no angular sizes of perspective on the globe model. Everything is orthographic. So for a start, that can't happen. But you could take an angular measurement to the sun and then decide what size everything else is and distance everything else is based on that angular size and the size and distance you give to that. Because you can't measure the distance to the sun, but you can take an angular size and then, which is something that ca can't happen on a globe model, but then you can create a globe model and solar system based on it, and the maths could be all completely different from the solar system where we actually are claimed to be in now. Because, and it, but it doesn't matter, because you start with your benchmark, which is the angular size of the sun, and you are saying, you can say the sun is 600,000 uh, uh, miles wide instead of 800,000 miles wide in diameter, 
and work everything from there and change everything around. It doesn't matter what size, you can make the earth the size it is, the globe earth the size it is, not matter there, it's just the sizes of everything else in comparison to the, you, to the you, know, you know. You know what's funny, it makes it even, that question they used to ask us all the time, or oh, why doesn't the angular size of the sun change, makes it even worse. Way worse. <laughs> <laughs> if, How do you have angular size of the globe? <laughs> if Venus wasn't our twin and was only half the size, then the sun would be twice as big. Oh, the moon completely arbitrary but adam's absolutely right so the scale is all we have from kepler's third law of interplanetary motion now you need something to give that scale actual sizes to to assert them in however many whatever size they make the sun and all the other planets right well those physical sizes that they ascribe have only been done by scaling venus with the same r value as earth and what adam's just said is if you made venus half the size that would put it that would what would that do to the sun double the size of the sun did you say it was half the size was it go the other way half the size sorry go the other way it would make the sun half as big wouldn't it because it it's the relationship between its transit across the sun so if it, it was smaller then the sun would be relatively smaller so relatively that, yes but... i don't know about half but yeah yeah whatever the scale changed to you know you'd have to do you'd actually have to apply kepler's third law to work out the actual change but it i'm being pedantic just because there's going to be some maths boffing that, <laughs> that pulls you up on it in the, in the chat no it has... i got it the wrong way around so <laughs> I, I, I know you said bigger it, that's not what i mean either i just mean that when you say half the scale would 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 change all over the place right so it wouldn't necessarily be half if you halve the size of venus it's not that it's not that not exactly, no. Because no, it's not, but, it, but you're not I'm being pedantic in that regard. I'm just saying what you, your point is that you can change all of the sizes once you've got one thing to reference it, to, to scale it with. And the one thing that they hadn't got but then ascribed was Venus. Well, that's what they used. And they said, that, well, we've got it because we've got the transit of Venus, right? Yeah, well, that's, yeah Brian's so. point. that's Brian's point, the back engineering. And after you're done, John, after you're done, John, I want to do that real world example. Go on, John. I, I was just going to say that Kepler's uh, law of interplanetary motion relies on a far value of Earth, does it not? Yes, it does. That's correct. <laughs> I love that. That observation angles the polarity. Uh, uh, just let me make this point. Go ahead, Go ahead John. I just, I'll, I'll lead you in. Then, you say that the requirement is there for an R value. Yes, that's correct. Well, don't, you'll never get a radius value to a flat plane. That's just not happening. So the interplanetary law is moot. Well, it stands in violation of the celestial sphere model, does it not? As does heliocentrism. Yeah, it's that's done. Dust. Okay. Uh, real world example just happened in chat as you ended the show of what we talked earlier. Uh, Phil B says to General, I'm a subject uh, area expert in radiation. But prior to that, he said, I'm sorry, I read the wrong one. Uh, he said, uh, you don't know about amplitude, you poor thing, you. Then I saw that as an opening and I wrote, Phil B, so you don't know anything about the elevation angles, you poor thing, you. Then Phil B responded, just as the chat ended, 10th man, in your dreams, how do you get an elevation angle from the top of a mountain? I responded, which never made the chat because it ran out of time. Uh, what's your reference, Phil? So we can do one here, just like they do with boats falling over the edge. So Phil B is saying, he wants to say, how do you get uh, an angle from the top of the mountain? And I thought the most proper thing is, what are you using for reference? What, what do you think he would say? Well, would he say artificial horizon with a marine section? Yeah, but what did Al Baruni do? But he used an astrolabe, which is a Another angle measuring too. No, no, but what do you have to measure first? What reference point do they have to go off of? 
Well, you'd have I to told him he needs the bubble sextant. Well, it depends. How, well, no, it, if he's not, he won't need to know the height of the mountain if he's taking an elevation angle to a celestial body. So he had, to get sea, he had to get sea level as a reference to get the height of the mountain. Then he went on top of the mountain and he looked at the horizon, the offing, at an obtuse angle. And then he did what? Well, it depends. If he's, ang if he's taking an angle to a celestial body, celestial body, he won't need the height of the mountain. Right. He just, needs a, he just needs a horizontal reference point, which would be the bubble. Yeah, or the artificial horizon. Or the artificial so, horizon. But if he's going to use the actual sea horizon, he's going to have an obtuse angle from the top of the mountain, right? Yeah, which you'll have to correct. Which you means what to, does he have to do? Well, he'll have to correct, use height of void correction down to sea level. There you, the angle triangle. there you go. There you go. It's over. I don't know what Phil's babbling about. Well, regardless of what he's talking about, none of this is possible on the globe. Besides the fact that geometrically it's not possible, mathematically it's not possible because globe maps are orthographic. There is no angles or perspective. You know yes. what I mean? He, yes. he, can't, he, he can't do any of these things on the globe. Can't be done. These, these, the star doesn't have an angular position or something doesn't have an angular size on the globe. It has an so, actual position, an actual size only. So is that why... Brian, all the tables and the numbers for correction for true altitude and elevation angles are not done from the surface of the globe, but a central circle that's a disk flat plane. Is that why it only can happen from there? Yeah, that's why it happens from there, because there's nowhere else to do. You have to do it from a horizontal plane. And put it into orthographic view using the celestial sphere model, uh, uh, you have to treat the sky as as being curved because you want to show perspective, and then you have to treat then pretend that that curved sky is then the surface of your globe. But it's all wow. back calculation from like it all starts with one thing: the rise and drop rate of Polaris. They have to get that right, and then after that they went on to the angular size of the sun, and then work everything else around those two things. They got a radius for their globe. So that created their globe for them. And then they have an angular size of the sun. But both of those things, the radius came from flat out eleva elevation angles to Polaris, and the angular size is an angular size. You can't have any of those things on the globe. But that's where the globe comes from. That's where that whole two, heliocentric uh, two points, model comes from. Right. Can I say something? Now, two Sorry. points. Go Number on, one, it's a cute angle. Number two, what the hell is he doing on a mountain with a mariner sextant? Doesn't he know where he is on that mountain? Well, he might use an artificial horizon. That he could use a mariner section. You have to use a mariner section for that. If you want. Say again? Well, to use Say an again? artificial horizon, he needs to use a mariner section. Mariner section. What's he doing on top of a mountain with the f in sextant? He should have a cross staff. <laughs> <laughs> he shouldn't be up there with a sextant if he believes he's a global. He shouldn't be up there because there's a militarised black swan waiting for him when he gets there. Right. I just want to... I'm sorry. But if you... I just wanted to say that reminds me about uh, the on. early discovery of... Remember when we figured out when the globers tell us or the anti-flat earthers, where's your edge, flat earthers? Where's your edge? But... Not only were they projecting their predicament, because of course the globe has a geometric edge you're looking at, but also that same globe is actually based off a flat earth disk that within its conception has an edge. So they're like double projecting onto us because we don't uphold either of the specific models. It's all edges for them and not for us. Right? Yeah, well, mathematically, their globe has an edge. It's a globe. Right, the actual globe within their model has an edge, but yeah. also the, the disk, the flat disk on which that globe model was founded has an edge. You could say that's like the Flat Earth Society disk, and that thing has no. an edge, right? No, 
No, because the, pers the, because the celestial sphere model is only shown perspective. So you will only be, it's down to how far you will be able to see due to your vision and optics. It's not, that doesn't mean that's the edge that you can fall off or that's a, a, limit, or a limiting point. They just made it into a limiting point within their globe. That's right. It's they not really a limiting point. It's <laughs> they not geometrically made it. a limit. Right. So they made it in their globe model and they made the flatter society as a control opposition to conceal that it's all based off that flat disk that the, the flatter society ridicules by showing it to be a literal disk in space, which has an edge, just like the globe. So Somebody they're on the PM edge. We question. are not. Somebody PM me a question. Maybe I could put it out to the board. Hello, sir. I had a question. I have a globe tard that says we need radius for dip correction formula. Does radius factor in at all? <laughs> dip correction. Um, it doesn't. Yeah. No new. It doesn't. No new one. Sorry, Jason. Come on. Nathan. It's, no. <laughs> well, well, no. It, it does within the current dip correction. Right, right. But we don't need a radius. You have permission to use old and busted and new hardness dip correction. <laughs> yeah. This is the destruction of this, what I was said. We don't need a radius. They need a radius for their new Correct. dip correction, which is right. from a geometric horizon using 7 over 6 or bringing the line from up from that horizon to the real horizon. They need a radius, but we know where they got the radius from. It was from elevation, flat earth elevation angles to Polaris. That's where the radius comes from. I've shown the maths right down to the decimal place. That's exactly where it comes from. So that question means nothing to, to us. If that's the question they need to be asking themselves. If they're believing this nonsense about their new dip correction, then where did ye you get your radius? Because we know. No radius, no edge. Dip, dip correction is just high to buy above sea level. What Brian is trying to explain here, if I can find the illustration, or just imagine in your mind, is when you have the sensible horizon, which is just a horizontal, because we only have one horizon. Hang on, that's I'm, just a, cut in I'm talking about what's shown in the Davis Sextant Manual. No, no, I understand. shown by Metabunk and others. I'm, I'm not arguing with you. Same. I'm just, I, I'm just going to show what I read from their own books as well. So what I'm saying is, I've shown this to Nathan before. It is the difference between the visible horizon and the uh, sensible horizon. Now, because they draw the dingleberry, they have to draw that line to show a curve on that dingleberry. And this is where they do the angle measurement, showing that they're correcting for a curve of that dingleberry. But in its express wordage or explanation, definition, whatever you want to put it, it's the difference between the visible horizon, the offing that we went over already, as far as you can see the horizon from shore, where you still see the hull and the whole ship. It's the difference between that and the sensible where you have a bubble horizon at your eye line. And those two are parallel and dip is purely height and eye. That dingleberry and that angle don't belong there. I could destroy that all day long. Too late, I already said yeah. no. And if they did, ask him, how'd you get your radius? <laughs> Well, yeah, it, it, that's actually a projection question, really, isn't it? You know, was well, they're claiming dip correction needs a radius. So where did you get your radius then? Where did I get my radius for my dip correction? That's what they should be asking, isn't it? We don't need no stinking radius. <laughs> yeah, well, look, the thing about it is, is that I, I, I continually call that correction height of all because there was such a convolution between the original dip correction, which was just height of eye, and the current claimed dip correction, which is a mathematical globe correction, 
which is no no correlation whatsoever to reality. So the question is back to them. Where did he get his radius for his globe zip, zip correction? We have a problem that's even bigger. All the angle measurements for the almanac and for sextant use come from a center, a, a circle that's a disc, that's flat. Uh, there is no dip correction when you go to the actual measurement itself. It's coming from a flat baseline. They're presupposing you're on this curve, dingleberry, doing it. But then when you look at the pictures, they've got a snow globe up there with a smaller circle, which is the field of view of your vision to the offing, and then the dome of the protractor above your head to show you 90 degrees to zero. And so it's not even being done the way they're saying. It has to match the angle from the center of a presupposed globe, which is a flat disk. You can't do that on the surface of an arc. So they'd make a little snow globe and say, this is your local horizon. Well, what's the distance of that local horizon that I'm going to get an angle to work? It's the offing. It's a smaller circular flat disk. It's just the same one at the center brought up to the top. Neither of them are true because there's, there's no globe that we get a center calculation or measurement uh, numbers from. We just live on a flat plane. I heard somebody had had a citation that said uh, we get elevation angles off a off a globe. Did, did that guy ever come back with that or not? Uh, I guess that Harris virus. He was mentioned in the live show at least. Oh, I wasn't even talking about virus. Yeah, I mean, if, if Iris got one, that'd be cool too. I mean, this so I was talking about the guy that asked you if you had any reference, any references. Oh, uh, Ed Masto was it? Who was it? Hoymar. Hoymar. No, he never came back with any references. I had ten lined up. People are like, oh, Nathan was so quick to them. It's like, well, I've had them lined up so I can just cut and paste them into comments when people say, oh, there's no proof that you need an elevation angle from a flat plane. Here's 10 citations. The way it came out was epic, though. It's beautiful. Full video of that comes out on the weekend. It's already available to members. There's two of them. So I've released two little tiny little clips um, and then kept the edited videos which took a lot of work i kept them back for the members they took that much work but that will get but they'll get released to the public this weekend mostly adam and qe with me interjecting i noticed that <laughs> there's a reasonable amount of rumpusing between adam and hoimar the moment i pipe up and at that point i kept quiet for about 20 25 minutes like straight not said a word and then I pipe up because it gets to the point that I'd tried to reiterate with him 25 or 24 times up, up until that point. And the moment I start making my point about, no, what you'll be correcting from is a geometric horizon, you started off by saying you'd be correcting from the refracted horizon. Not correct. You can't correct an angle from a bent line. Well, when it got to that, he immediately started rumpusing me. And I've been talking for about five seconds. <laughs> So it's like when people moan that the, the, the mute buttons used to do, it's like, no, what actually happens is your points get annihilated. You know, refracted angles being corrected. Nah, that gets summarised. And the moment you hear how it's getting pummeled, you start talking through any of the panel members and me. That's what the fundies mean when they project the crap that they get muted here. No, they don't. Otherwise, why am I wouldn't have had the opportunity to rumpus the crap at me. And I took his nonsense of correcting bent angles apart as he needed to. When you read him that, um, what is that, that, um, what's it called again? The citations. Did he even have an answer for that? No. He just stood quiet after that, correct? Yeah, he just went quiet.
Didn't he say he had a ton? Yeah, he had a ton. So I went and got one of my 10 and immediately rattled it off because I'd literally have the iPad open on that page next to me. So literally, well, have you got any citation that says it needs to be flat? Yeah, from the elevation angle, from the flat plane that the observer's standing on. Something like that. Sustainable by design is the citation. I got a load isn't of them. it disturbing? Isn't it disturbing that they, they keep saying it's it's 2022 and they keep saying the refracted horizon. Number one, they don't know what refraction is. Number two, even in their fairy tale worldview, the horizon isn't refracted. Like, you guys got to get up to date with the flat earth debate, dude. You're about six years behind. Glad but, you've said that. I, I can't get over but, that. Every time I hear that refracted horizon, it just. Yeah, yeah, Owen's about to pipe up. Belly uh, yeah, yeah, that's what, what I stressed in the beginning of the, the live show. So, no, there's no uh, excusing them and saying that they can, they can, you know, they're okay to just be cool with believing in a refracted horizon. It's like, no, you're a heretic. The moment you start claiming that that horizon that's supposed to be proven with its physical limitation ability at 1.2 times the square root of the observer's height and feet, you're a heretic. Yeah, but that's not fair, because if they can't do that, then they can't counter the black swan argument. It's can't just counter be the so black painful. swan argument. They did counter the black swan argument with refraction, and that destroys their geometry. We told them it from day one, but they continued for two straight years, right into the face of angle corrections from dip, and now they're buggered. Well, a paradox is yeah, but Arwen, nothing. Arwen, that's the point, right? You say it's not fair because then they can't counter that's right. the whole point, because who are the heretics? The ones that are actually countering this argument. The ones that don't need to, the ones that are sitting in the back and just believe because consensus or whatever the hell, uh, uh, Santa Claus, it doesn't matter. They don't care. They don't have to argue that they're, 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 the horizon's refracted. But the ones that do, the ones that step up to this, they have to. So they have to be become heretics just to argue this, uh, their point. Right, because a paradox is better than nothing. Well, someone's got to argue it, right? Although it is right? nothing, but if you don't <laughs> that, understand that, that, then it's better. That's the sad, lonely uh, road they've chosen, right? They, someone has to argue with us. We can't just let these flat earthers running around just asking questions and debunking shit all over the place. So there's a certain group that say we, we have to defend our globe. We have to... <laughs> fight the flat earth <laughs> right because the shit obviously Pe can't stand on its own two legs their model doesn't speaking hold of, any damn water so there you go speaking of antiquated but, nonsense that they just keep bringing back up that's a train wreck hey nathan check master b this was posted in chat this morning by hoymark it must to be the last thing that was posted. Oh, it's by you. Oh, it's from Soundly. Oh, how sweet. Okay, I've got it up on screen so the audience can see what we're talking about. So what's his claim? It's too small for me to read on my screen. It was constructed from rather short modules. So it's just level, full stop. And it turns out Following a level water surface means arcing along a huge circle? <laughs> what? So it's just level. Okay, well, that, that I understand. So because it's just level, it's arcing around a circle. That That's the, the most glaring double speak I've ever heard in my entire life. Well, Matthew, you didn't, you didn't hear level, le levels the new curves. You didn't hear <laughs> How did the Boulder Saxons walk then? How do they get an elevation angle then? If what they actually thought was level was actually bending, then how did they get elevation angles to anything ever? Nathan, I posted those what, what, slides um, if you. Oh, go on, Brian. I just want to say what Hoimar is, from what I could tell, there is referring to is when it was surveyed by the looks of Jesse Kozlowski. And he had to use, he had to planarize the whole area. That was his exact word. So basically what they did is they, they these ballers keep going out there and trying to survey it. But they have to survey it in Cartesian, three, in three-dimensional Cartesian, uh, I think two-dimensional, then three-dimensional Cartesian, 
flat plane coordinates, and then they add in aura afterwards. They all do the exact same thing. It, they all do the same thing. They go out and survey the Lake Pontre train bridge and whatever else, and they have to survey the whole thing flat, horizontal, like from a zero, a zero horizontal with elevation changes. And then they had to add an or every time. <laughs> the saddest, saddest. Have they have they all convinced themselves that that's where the curvature is at Lake Pontchartrain? <laughs> Why is it? <laughs> yes. What the hell? <laughs> what year is it again? Lake Pontchartrain? Come on, Hoymar. I know you're you're brand new to this, but come on. Hey, you're bringing up that. And nonsense. Nate, the next image he followed up with the next image in Master B. Check this one after visible horizon in Muppet vision. Is that the one? Nah, Lake Ponch and Train Causeway, it's a diagram, like a shadow diagram of Soundley's Bridge. I've got it, I've got it. It says, Lake Ponch and Train Causeway, Soundley's observations. The model predicts, that's a belly laugher, that the bridge should curve down below eye level. <laughs> Yeah, hashtag shit shrinks. Say so again. Hashtag shit shrinks. According to the <laughs> globe earth model, right, these pillars in the near foreground, let's just say they're 80 feet tall. Just for easy numbers. Yeah. Well, according to this picture, the one behind it's smaller. I mean, I could run a ruler on it and show that it's smaller. But according to the globe earth maths, it's the same size. They're both 80 feet. Well, this diagram can't possibly be right because it's showing it getting smaller. So the globe earth's saying something completely contrary to that. You know, this should still be 80 feet. I don't really understand why they're showing it with perspective included when it's 80 feet at any distance. That's not how it's represented here. According to this diagram, it's getting smaller into the distance. Well, that would be the cause of its recession into the distance. Where's that in the globe Earth maths? These are all 80 feet. Can I make a correction? Say again, John? Can I make a correction? Yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, um, instead of saying globe Earth maths and globe Earth model, it should be flat Earth uh, globe maths and flat Earth model of a globe. Yeah, they're derived from a flat Earth, so it should be flat Earth model of a globe. Yeah, I don't have any issue with that. Or a right. global reification of a flat Earth model. Can I just throw something out there? Now, I, finish, that, look, I, got, I was trying to finish that earlier discussion. Yeah, 10th was next. Sorry, man. All right. Hey, but, do you want me to, well, to make this point before we well, finish? This is important. Yeah, can well, we start with not... train just for a sec? I have... Yeah, go ahead. I have a really <laughs> old school thing. Probably knew first and then. Oh, no, no, 10th first. I've got the visible horizon <laughs> diagram up. Do you want to go ahead? Okay. I, I I did another one of these after the poncha train. Maybe it's a little clearer, but let's just go with this because it's clear enough for me. Visible horizon is a small circle on the Earth's surface bounding the observer's field of vision at sea. Sounds like the offing that we showed in the earlier show today. The radius of the visible horizon increase as the observer's height of eye increase. That makes sense. Okay, so there's the observer, and the sensible horizon would be a horizontal if you had a bubble sextant or a spirit level at your eye line. So that's one level plane at your eye line. Then you've got the dingleberry surface of Earth, which doesn't belong here, but this is how they fool people. And then you've got dip recognized as the difference between sensible horizon, the parallel horizontal at your eye line, to the visible horizon. Okay, just keep that in mind not that other one going to the geographical horizon that Brian says that they've changed to. They put it there. That's what they want us to think. Next. Shows the sun, the horizon, and an operator with a mariner sextant. Not the bubble horizon, but the actual horizon being shot. Okay, you can see the angle being achieved there. Next. Then you've got this figure. Shows the zenith. The observer's eye, which is a sensible horizon with the bubble sextant level at eye level above the surface of the Earth. Then you got the geoidal horizon, which is uh, the tangent of the observer's eye on this circle. 
not a sphere or earth, but just a circle. Right there is the tangent of the eye if you bring it down to the surface of a curved surface. And that's a straight line. Now, basically what they're saying here in a convoluted way is that the gap between the sensible horizon and the geoidal horizon where the eye comes down the tangent that meets the ball there or circle. If you go back to the first slide, that is really what's happening. Um, let me go there. So you got the observer sensible, and then the dip is height of eye above sea level. So they bring their eyeball to the sea level, draw a straight line all the way out over the dingleberry, and the gap difference between those two straight lines is height of eye or dip, okay? Now, if you go to the Navy one with the Comet program, and they show it on the ship here, they're using what as a reference? Sea level, not sea curve. And the dip correction is the correction from the height of the observer with the section shooting at the visible horizon, the offing, as far as you can see. And that is all parallel to a bubble sextant at the sensible horizon. So dip correction is just merely height of eye over our sea level. They put the dingleberry there to make you think dip is more than what is spoken of. I'm done. Cool. Thanks, Tent. You got my screen. Cool. Oh, one thing, one thing for Brian's point, they do put the geometric horizon there, but since we can never see it unless there was no air, how do they correct for it mathematically? But do they actually correct for it? No, it's the difference between a parallel at your eye and the parallel that the sea level gives you. That's the real dip. That's what Brian was trying to say. You want to present something, Kazim? Yeah. yeah, just just to go back to 2015 and 2016, the Ponty train stuff. Um, one of my many geeky moments. I thought I'd explore what he was doing, how he was doing it. Um, how could I make the Ponty train curve? Um, so what you see here is a built. A big Lego poncho train bridge. Um, so I knew it was flat and straight on, on my kitchen worktop. And what I did was just take a standard image with my lens. And then all I've done there is, is draw a, a straight line in, you know, in Photoshop after just to show it straight. <laughs> Irrespective of perspective, it's the surface is straight. And then I've set about trying to forge Sandy's work, which is what I think I've done here. Now, as you can tell, this is the same bridge, slightly different angle, and more importantly, a repositioning of the bridge within the position of the frame. Um, and that is what I suggest you see with Sandy's work. He's looking through telescopes and stuff. And what I think he's doing is is misaligning centre frame, so the point you're looking at is actually the distortion in the lens, which is what I achieved here and how I made my bridge curve. That was it. Can I just state uh, a couple of things to state? Right, I'll try and be fast. Number one, the problem with the whole soundly thing, or it was the problem, is everyone was focusing on the bridge, right? Now, Nathan's correct, and Adam, you're not correct. You're, you're not incorrect in what you're showing. And Nathan is 100% correct, especially today, talking about angular sizes. Can't happen. There is no angular size change. So any photograph that shows an angular size change, it means it's not a globe. Simple as. But in the background of that photograph, Stanley's photograph, especially the ones that he really highlighted and really put a lot of work into layering and making sure everyone could see, there is inferior mirage at the other side. Inferior mirage is only possible with two, when there is two things present. Number one, 
the air pressure that is at or very close to sea level and to a surface. There you go. They are the conditions for an inferior mirage. You One more, Brian. Inferior... Sorry? One more. You must have a clear line of sight to the object that's being miraged as well. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, that was just kind of a given to the looking at. But you can't have an inferior mirage. You don't see them at the sides of mountains and up on airplanes. You don't see them there. You only see them at a surface that is at or close to sea level because you, it requires a physical surface and, and the air pressure and temperatures that are present at, at, that, at, that, at those elevations. Right? The fact that there's an inferior mirage in the background is only one of a whole list of things that destroys. But the fact that they're talking about it now was so sad. You know, because all we need to even say now is, well, there's angular size and that, that's not possible on a globe that. You know, it's over. They have nothing. But well, the, the point... soundly the guy that called the, the geometric horizon word soup? <laughs> <Was it Yeah>. Right? <laughs> yeah. Geometric yeah. horizon, that's word soup. Oh, oh really? <laughs> that's great. Can, can I hit you with a bigger point? Something I have meant to say this, not just today, but some time back, and I kept forgetting about it. Because, you know, you'd be waiting, someone's talking ahead of you, and then it, time goes on, and you go on to a different subject, and it goes, it goes away. Their claim of a refracted horizon, right? This refracted horizon claim. How does that work, even orthographically now? I'm talking orthographically. With their horizon drop rate for Polaris. If the horizon is refracting and at a rate that they can control, how could they get a horizon drop rate to Polaris orthographically? Because their horizon is going to be rising and dropping orthographically within that claim, is it not? So how do they, they have can't. a horizon drop rate to Polaris? They can't. They can't because the rising drop rate to Polaris is about, you know, Polaris in, in relation to the horizon. And orthographically, that would mean that the sphere are going back down over or, or up over, that the horizon in front of the person is going to be rising and dropping. Rising and dropping. So how did they, how did they have a rising drop rate to Polaris? Sounds well, like a using bunch of words to me. Well, how did they do it using Earth Curve if, there's, if the horizon can refract? Which it can't, but within their claim. It, their claim kills their other claim, orthographic claim of Polaris, which is the whole backbone of their globe. They do that a lot, don't they, Brian? Kill themselves. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, also, uh, as John refracted the curvature, John, is going to be doing has done and as we've all done here the horizon uh has to be level uh because we read the description what the offing is it's as far as you can see with your eye to the horizon and of course weather could play a factor in that one day you'll you see a greater distance and then another day due to fog a lesser distance right so what happens after that that your eye gives up on you is proven by uh, BLMSB 69 when he took P900 and went past what the eye saw with the P900. And we saw the horizon went beyond the, the platforms. So then with a sextant, you shoot the horizon. You could only see so far given the day, but it goes beyond what you see to the GP of a sun or a star and that radius of that single uh, circle of equal altitude is a straight line back to you, Brian, because radius lines are what, Brian? Bent or straight? Straight lines. Flat Earth all the way. It's optical. Well, does that, has anyone, Kent, has anyone who ever took an, an, an elevation angle, a flat Earth elevation angle to Polaris? Has anyone who has ever done that, have they, have they ever had to take, have they ever had to subtract a seven over six or refraction no. value from their, from their, from every one of their angles? Because they would have to do that from every one of their angles. Yeah. If you no, what... imagine, just one second, if you, if you, if you take their claim of a refracted horizon into account, they would have had to subtract 
seven over six hours from every single observation. And then when it gets down below 15 degrees, they'd have two different refractions to deal with. Celestial real world refraction and their seven over six hours. Even, like I'm talking in a world of nonsense now because none of these things can happen on a globe. But the oh, point is, no one has ever, tent. has anyone ever had to subtract seven over six R from a standard no, elevation? I you've, you've, you've got a really good point there in terms of within celestial navigation, there are logs, tables, um, ta titled um, refraction tables, which give you corrections for things below certain uh, height above the horizon. Interesting then that there isn't a correction for the horizon in of itself, as you say, for refraction. They don't claim it's moving around. They don't claim it's, yeah, they, it's still fixed relative, like everything was and is. It's fixed relative to that horizon in them. They don't. Nathan. Hello. Nathan around. What's this calling? Yes. Coffee time. Right. You, you lost Discord. Really? Check yeah, we were talking. <laughs> you couldn't hear anyone. Can you say hello in Discord, please? Hello yes, now. Please. Seems hello. fine. Hello in right. Discord. Hello, DJ hello in deck. Discord. Hello. All right. Now we're good. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Back. Can I, I add something? I was, I was trying thinking, to add. Like, why, why are they all blanking um, QE out? They've been a bit nasty like. <laughs> I was trying to add something to Brian's point uh, about that issue with uh, the sextant and the elevation angles to Polaris. Yeah, that point was birthed milliseconds after the black swan was thought of, by the way. That's the problem. Yeah, well, I mean, just, just what Adam was talking about there. Adam was addressing what I said there a minute ago. Do they ever have to? This is COQE. Do they ever have to, when they're taking elevation angles to Palaos to determine its rise and drop rate with distance? Did they, did they at any point ever have to subtract for a seven over six or? No. Yeah. No. That's that. Well, that was the checkmate. Yeah, so when they put that into orthographic view, when the ballers hijack that and put it into orthographic view, there is no 7 over 6 R. So then claiming that the horizon is refracted completely destroys every other, all other claims they ever made. Because their own Polaris horizon drop rate has no 7 over 6 R involved. I mean, that is a good point. Why, why would they ever not include that, right? When they're the ones who've been telling us for two years, everything is always refracted, always. Because we have atmosphere, yeah. right? Well, if the horizon can be refracted chocolate, then how could they not have added that in? According, Adam to, say, yeah, go on. according to Mick West's amended calculus, because the first one didn't have it, but that's what they amended in. But as you're saying, it's not, it's not in celestial navigation, that. Well, their globe has to orthographically match the, the rate of drop for that curvature, right? has to match the rate of drop for Polaris because it's not a perspective issue, it's an earth curve issue. So if the horizon can be refracted within their claim, then that means they're, 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 that their orthographic Polaris rise and drop rate doesn't work. They can't because they're using a physical, like because they, they turned the the flat plane that was being used. That celestial navigation never need to change. They ne never need to use calculations for a change in the position of the horizon for any of their elevation angles to Polaris or anything else. So if they're claiming the horizon could be refracted, then where are the corrections within celestial navigation for this for this corrected horizon? Brian, let me answer that because I was trying to earlier and I got to go. I got another call. But here's the deal. It's not the horizon. It's the luminary that comes down above the horizon up to 15 degrees, sometimes 20. Yeah. That They say it's that that has to be corrected for the density of the air that it's in 
above the horizon and it's due to sea water temperature meeting air temperature. And they say, if you don't wanna have major math equations to figure this out, even though we know them and it could be a, no more than 34 minutes correction at those levels, they even tell you what's the worst is, all right? But that's from the horizon to that 15 degrees. Above that, it's a non-issue to them. Because at 90, at 90, the luminary has no refraction. It has to hit that, that criteria of 15 or 20 degrees, sometimes 10, depending on what book you look at. And it's the luminary being corrected, not the horizon. The horizon has to be the reference plane. That cannot change. But that's the point. That's the point me and Adam are I know. About, yeah. I know. I'm validating the only your corrections. Point. Yeah, exactly. The only corrections are for below 50, let's say as an average 15 degrees. Of the star. For, and that's a correction to the position of the star, not a not, correction for the position of the horizon. Bravo. Bravo. Well said. Good show, guys. I got to go. See you then. Thank you. Bye, it, their claim concerning their rebuttal for the black swan, even though it destroys them, well, as a rebuttal it destroys them, but it completely annihilates the model afterwards. There's no corrections for 7 over 6, six or in celestial navigation, because the horizon is not claimed to move. I know there's a the mathematical dip correction that happens, but there's no correction that this is, a, this, it only happens if they want it to happen, but there's no correction other than that. Where is all the corrections? But, but the Polaris thing is the worst for them because there is no seven over six or corrections within the whole Polaris rise and drop rate. It doesn't exist. Orthographically, that's solid earth, whether it be water or land, whatever. It's a solid core uh, globe earth. There's no corrections for seven over six or. You, you said, where are all the corrections? They're, 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 they're right with all the corrections done to the Coriolis. <laughs> That's where they are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. We don't have yeah. any of those. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, but the deep correction is just uh, the correction to the sea level. So it's not a big, big thing to understand. So yeah, I don't understand that they are thinking that it can be something else. What are they really thinking uh, deep correction is? The correction to, to the center of the core? Yeah, but John, they I don't really have understand. A claim. But no, yeah, yeah, it, originally, dip correction and height of white correction were just the same thing. But now, there are two different things. They're, the dip correction they're talking about is a mathematical correction from a geometric horizon to the, the actual horizon. And then they do void of void. So when they mention dip correction, they're, they're likely to equivocate within a conversation or a debate. They'll equivocate between both those positions. Heumard, okay, but uh, talking on here. Okay, excuse me. Okay, excuse me. But actual horizon, we only have uh, one view to one hor horizon. We don't have a multi multi horizon. We don't have anything else. We just, and uh, yeah, there is no geometric horizon that we can uh, measure to. So we are talking about the horizon that is on the sea level. So it's no question for me. I don't understand how they can um, really think about it some something else it is just a correction to the sea level that's it nobody can say anything else i don't understand why it's so much problem because right? some people still want to believe in santa claus that's why well yeah, but it's, it's insane it's just, but just john these are the things they mathematically add in as a form of hijacking they are mathematical hijackers of real world uh, phenomena. That's what they are. And that's what they've always done. They have to hijack everything from every <laughs> time, they want to hijack refraction, refraction, hijack all perspective and visual effects. They, they want to hijack every, every uh, discipline that there is that involves the use of the earth, whether it be surveying, navigation, you know, uh, aerospace. They, they do their best to hijack as much as possible. That's all they got is hijacking. Yeah. Yeah. They're a bunch of math pirates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a new world. Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. This, yeah. it is very, very easy to understand. Just uh, if they just uh, can relax and uh, uh, see what's about. It, uh, what is there for corrections? How many corrections do we have to do, and so on for for the navigation? Yeah, we ha we have to take decoration in. It, it is diff different decoration in the uh, in the middle of America and uh, different decoration in uh, Iceland because of. Uh, Magnetic uh, activity and so on, uh, and it is change also changing every every year just a little bit. So some some uh, some places are not changing at all, and other places changing a lot. That, that is correction we have uh, to do. Well, no, there's no there's no earth curve correction. That's a fact. Absolutely no 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 earth uh, curve and. Uh, uh, there is no arc curve taken in in uh, uh, you take X men uh, to be a uh, steerman or captain or something like that. There is nothing about that in the X men, and I I done done that by myself, and I know <laughs> there was nothing about the curve. That's it. But my overarching point with this is. Even their current claim of dip correction, which is a 7 over 6 all correction, that is not part of the flat earth elevation angles to Polaris that they hijacked. The flat earth elevation angles to Polaris had none of that. That's because there when is no hijacked, there. Yeah, but see, this thing, when that is hijacked and it's turned into a 21,600 nautical mile sphere, there is no 7 over 6 all after being added in. They are using that and the whole mathematics of why on their globe Polaris appears to rise and fall due to someone going back down over or back up over their sphere. That is purely based on an earth that doesn't have 7 over 6 R. Added in, mm -hmm. a globe earth that doesn't have 7 over 6 R. There is no 7 over 6 R in their Polaris claim. This is the problem. So their current dip correction claim, mathematical claim, means nothing when it comes to that, because that dip correction claim, that 7 over 6 or claim, has no place in their Polaris claim, which is the origin of their radius. The origin of the whole globe model started with flat earth elevation angles to Polaris. But they don't have 7 over 6 or in there, because they can't, because they have to hijack what we saw. What did we see? We saw, what did we get? We got flat earth elevation angles. We didn't change the position of the horizon. We used the horizontal plane. That that over a span of across the earth could be made using the longitude lines. Could be made into twenty one thousand six hundred nautical miles of a radius, if you want to call it that, using the latitude and longitude grid. And they turned that into the circle, and then they they uh, they gleaned the radius from that. But there was no seven over six all in that. Yeah, that's for sure. I understand that. Neil, you're off mute. Sorry. You want to say something? I don't know why that keeps happening. But I do want to say something about that offing word. The only thing I think of when I hear offing is, you know, we got to off these flat earthers. Yeah, Aussies uh, from Australia, yeah. And uh, <laughs> there is a big uh, conversation between uh, Aussies. That's a big thing, yes. We're offing them, the ballers and the anti flat earthers. Yeah. Well, I know they're offing themselves every time they say refraction. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> it's true. They shoot themselves in the foot, in the head. <laughs> How many planes in this field? By the way, Nathan, do you have any Horizontal vacation? planes, that is. Oh, what, Neil? Play more. 
The way yeah, he acted 10. was perfect. He said it, and you just rattled it right off, and he stood silent. It's perfect timing. that this goes against your sphere belief when you've already defined what it is and what it's used for. No, it doesn't make any assumptions about the surface. I'm not sure where you're getting this from. It's utilising the flat surface and you're drawing a parallel line out to that flat surface. Ipso facto, it is functionally flat. Uh, yeah, every plane you establish is going to be flat. That's a geometric fact. Ipso facto, we are just factually navigating on a plane, then. Nathan, can you give a citation of a single manual for celestial navigation stating that we are navigating on a flat plane? Quote, the elevation angle describes how the sun appears in the sky. The angle is measured between an imaginary line between the observer and the sun and the horizontal plane the observer is standing on. It doesn't matter that this goes against... Citation from... Uh, where was that? Um, I've forgotten the name of the citation now, but yeah, that was the one that was referring to when I rattled it off on the spot. But with that, I'm going to say another huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, joining as a member and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video.